flying saucers and ETs in government conspiracies. But I've seen none of the above. If I did, I think I probably would run a million miles. Lose my little mind. Hi, everybody, and welcome along to another episode of X Files Talk X Files. The only podcast that was foolish enough to watch Tempest Fugit before getting on a plane in a couple of days. Although, to be honest, I'm a little bit more concerned about some comments I made about the TSA in a previous podcast. Hopefully they haven't heard it. I am your host, David Howard, and I am broadcasting here today with Holly Simon and Trish Silver from xfilesnews.com. Hi, Holly. Hi, Trish. How are you both doing today? Hello. Pretty good. good. Excellent. Today we are talking um, the final sort of third of season four, so we have some really great episodes to talk about today. We're doing Tempest Fugit all the way through to Demons. We were going to do Gethsemane as well, but we've decided we're going to hold that over and discuss that three-part story in next week's episode. So let's get uh, right in there with um, the two-parter that kicks us off tonight, Tempest Fugit and Max. So this episode... These two episodes, they're not even, it's not even TV. This is a movie. And, you know, re-watching this, it's just struck you how slick these two episodes are. The production values, you know, I mean, X-Files production values are always, you know, a cut above everything else on TV. But these two episodes just take it to another level. It is, and watching them back to back, it really is just like you're watching a movie and, these two episodes, even though they are mythology, they don't they don't really gel that well with a lot of the other mythology episodes. There's you know a cover up going on here, but there's no cigarette smoking man involved. There's none of the real recurring characters are involved in these two stories, um, apart from exactly. But it it really is from you know it's a mythology story, and. Uh, it's just on a huge, huge scale, and maybe they're maybe they're getting ready to start, you know, running there with fight the future. But uh, these two episodes are just something else, you know. <laughs> yeah, they're fantastic, and and Max, uh, it's, it, it's such a great loss at the end of the the episode when at the next episode when he dies. It's 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 like you. Even though he wasn't in that many episodes in the X Files, you feel like you lost such an important and uh, livid character in the story. Yeah, and apparently they'd wanted to bring him back, you know, or they'd had plans to bring him back for a, quite a while before they actually got around to doing this two parter. So, yeah, and I particularly like the guy who's running the the uh, crash scene investigation. You know, he's only in these two episodes. But yeah, he's with, really good too. with the absence of the normal mythology characters, you know, he is able to sort of step up and sort of take a bit more of the spotlight. And he just has such an interesting arc throughout these two episodes that when you first see him, you know, he's addressing his room of investigators and Mulder, of course, comes in and makes these comments about, well, one of the passengers on this plane was a known alien abductee and he kind of makes some sort of joke about Star Trek. But then yeah. as the episodes progress, he becomes more and more open when he sees the evidence. And, you know, he's just t- going from the evidence, going straight to Mulder, and he's not even sort of questioning the logic behind it or the, um, you know, could this actually be real at all? He just sort of sees the right. evidence and that's what it looks like. It fits what Mulder was saying. And so he's extraordinarily open with that. Yeah, and- it's it's... Funny to watch how fast he he jumps on Mulder's boat about this because he well, when they first it's... meet they're just he's like you know he's like you're crazy that that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard and then the he's like overwhelmed with all this evidence and well, yeah, it's so it was fast how he turned. I like that. I like that a lot because like it, it, you can compare that to Scully like. She, she's, by now, she's been 
in the X Files for four plus years. Yeah, this guy two and episodes. There's <laughs> so much that she's already seen, even though like she has a scientific explanation about everything, but she's seen so much too that she hasn't been able to explain. And then this guy like two episodes in, and he's like, "Oh yeah, I believe you," just like that. Yeah, <laughs> Holly, what are you gonna say? Well, uh, that's about it. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's kind of strange that, you know, you have this whole sort of cover-up thing that's going on and, you know, the cigarette smoking man, the syndicate, is not involved in that cover-up. I mean, presumably he's, or his organization is somewhere, you know, behind the curtains. Right. You know, orchestrating all this stuff with the military and it's just quite interesting to see. It kind of feels, not just because Max is back, but because of the absence of all of that um, normal features of a mythology episode that we expect at this point, in the absence of that, it kind of feels like a season one story that there aren't any obvious antagonists there. You know, Mm -hmm. there's obviously some guys who are covering stuff up and we know who they are and, you know, we can see that they're shady, but we don't get the impression that Mulder and Scully are just being played and that they're up against the same people that they're always up against in this one. So it's right. kind of refreshing in that way. It takes it back to season one. And, you know, m- maybe that was something that they were playing with, you know, story-wise looking to the movie really? as well. Really? Really? It's a simpler version that goes back to a simpler time. It yeah. really does. It really does. And, you know, you have Mulder doing his usual thing of ditching Scully so he can go diving. Right. and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that scene when... He he's diving and he finds the UFO and the alien, but he mentions the UFO all the time, but he never says anything about the alien. And then, like, every other time after that, when he supposedly sees an alien or looks for one, he, he never brings back to this one. He never mentions that he actually saw one, because he did. Maybe he was just in a state of shock. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> You know, this thing that he's been looking for all his life, he finally sees it, and then yeah, he, he actually, just naturally he forgets sees it. it. That's, like, one of the, 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 the things that... It doesn't upset me or make me mad or anything, but it's just, like, I wish they would have gone a little bit more into that. But I guess, you know, like, he was in shock because that was the first time he ever saw anything. Like, he's ever saw one up close like that. But then by the end of the season, he's just... he I, I guess... The other reason why he never really talks about this because by the end of the season he's just thinking that it's the whole, the whole thing is a hoax anyway. He didn't yeah. believe his eyes. <laughs> uh-huh. um, sad part about this episode here, Max. Uh, I mean, they killed off Agent Pendrel. That's pretty sad. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's so sad. Like he don't, we don't get to see much of him, and then when you finally do, they just kill him all. Yeah, I don't know. They should have kept them around. <laughs> Yeah. I know, and he's been bumbling away, trying to awkwardly strike up conversation with Scully all this time. Right. You know, he finally gets a little bit of courage, courtesy of some birthday girl drinks, yeah. and uh, he Drunk. gets shot down. <laughs> <laughs> he, finally, he can finally say something to her, because he's drunk. So he he's just there, and then he's gone. It's sad. Yes, indeed. Of course, we have the um, the Apollo Eleven keychain, oh, yeah. which Mulder gives her as a birthday present. Apparently, uh, I really love it. Talk- what Scully says at the end It's just it's. I think it's very fitting. Yes. Yeah, and um, apparently on the DVDs, I, I didn't realize this. I haven't tested it, but I found out today that. Apparently on the DVDs, if you select the English um, closed captions when you're watching Tempest Fugit on the DVD, instead yeah. of the X-Files theme tune over the opening credits, they sing Happy Birthday, Dana. Oh, wow. I don't know if that's true. It's something I, I saw online. That. I'm going to have to so put the DVDs it, in after It needs to be check. validated. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to check that. Is that with a commentary or just... Just a caption line. I think if you, uh, what I saw it said, if you just select the English captions, okay, that it changes the audio somehow. But I don't, 
I don't know. That's funny. Is there anything about these two episodes that we haven't sort of touched on? I know there's so much that that goes on in these episodes with the military involvement. You know the. Um, I really love the 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 crash scenes. It, it, and just like you said in the beginning, this this is like a movie, and when you when you get the beginning of the the episode with the crash and the aerial shots. They are phenomenal with all the body bags. It's kind of like a, it's a dark few. It, it it comes back to that um, that topic we were talking about last week about the about gender list, because it's it, it, in in this case it's not the red, it's the yellow of the body bags, and yeah. you get like the aerial shots, and you see nothing but the, the crash side is so dark and gray and humid and ugly, and then you see all the body bags and it's really bright yellow it's i i love what they did with that it's it's brilliant yeah it's a good use of color there yeah you know, stark black and white almost and uh, there's just some great shots in that bit as well where Mulder and scully are walking through that wreckage and the camera is yeah. just sort of tracking them from behind these trees and it, it i mean it, everything about this two-parter is just elevated beyond Mm-hmm. You know everything else, especially now seeing it on Netflix it, on widescreen in high definition. It, it looks even better than you've seen it yeah. before. It really, oh, really absolutely, does. I agree. I would have to absolutely agree with that. I'm so glad that they decided to put all of these episodes on HD. And I, I was talking to somebody else about this before, and it's like when you when you rewatch this series in HD on Netflix, it's it's like you're watching it for the first time all over again because you see all these things that you never paid attention before and it's like all brand new things that you never you never saw all these different angles and and it's it's i love it it's great i think it's it's a really good thing that they did that yeah i mean you can you can really see with tempest fusion and max you know just because it is so cinematic anyway but you know uh, the final episode that we're going to talk about later on demons you know, you kind of have the old, very grainy sort of, you know, Super 8 or VHS kind of shots yeah. in that when you go into Mulder's memory, and then that's contrasted with the HD, and everything about that just really pops, you know, in high definition as well. So, yeah, you know, these two episodes are, are some really good ones to look at when you want to explain to somebody what the benefits of HD are and, and seeing X-Files right. in widescreen. Uh, yeah. All right, the second, well, the, the third episode that we're going to talk about tonight is Synchrony, which is not an episode I revisit frequently, but it's one that's always sort of stood out in my mind as um, a good episode from season four. And I think the thing that I really like about this episode is it is just the perfect example of the limitless possibilities of storytelling when it comes to X-Files. You know, we've yeah. we've had all sorts of different monsters, we've had all sorts of different mutants that have to eat livers or cancer or something to survive. But this is the first episode that goes really deep into um, more sort of sci-fi kind of territory, mm-hmm. you know. This is, you know, they've been trying to figure out a way of telling a, a time travel story using the X-Files for quite some time and they finally came up with this idea that it's you know it's not going to be about a time machine or or anything like that it's going to be something on off of atomic sort of science that's how people get to t- travel through time and of course the story that we work with here is on a small scale it's the guy who invented time travel going back and trying to stop it from ever being invented and even though it's dealing with time travel, there's only really that one scene where they are uh, leaving his apartment or leaving the old man's apartment who's come back from the future and they sort of look discussing this photo and Mulder says, um, maybe it's a celebration that mm-hmm. hasn't even happened yet. And they sort of yeah. have a brief sort of discussion there about time travel and Scully rolls her eyes and all of that. <laughs> but other than that, it's kind of tra- it's kind of treated as a straightforward sort of crime story even though it yeah. is about time travel and it's a very x file way to sort of touch on that very sci-fi concept mm-hmm. that's true 
I, I love that they they explored like a more kind of more like classic basic sci-fi theme on this because you know like the the X-Files is not that sci-fi it's it, it's more of a dark show more than anything else it, you can't really classify it as straight up sci-fi well no so everything about it is grounded that. in reality is grounded in yeah. science so that's the way they had to go it's no no yeah. i think the proper term should be pseudo science fiction okay let's go with that <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of this episode holly um uh, to be honest i don't quite remember it <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's, uh, it's like you said it's time, not i guess one. i visit much no, I mean, it, it's, I, I suppose it's memorable. There's a couple of, it's, it's memorable just because of the, what the story is, that it that it deals with time travel. And there's a couple of, you know, moments in there visually um, where the guy gets his hand frozen and all turns to ice. Um, yeah. But, you know, even what, re-watching it um, for this podcast, you know, they're trying to bring the person back to life who's been frozen and his body over. He comes back to life, but his body overheats and then he bursts into flames. In like and, <laughs> and I completely oh, forgotten God. that he bursts into flames because it seemed like <laughs> such a cliche kind of way for him to die after he'd been frozen to death previously. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, there's, there's some good bits in the episode, you know, and knowing what it is that it is about time travel you know it kind of seems a little bit like it's hitting you over the head sometimes like even just the intro teaser where the old guy is talking to these two college students and sort of saying this guy's going to get hit by a bus at exactly 11 46 yeah. p.m and, and and then it happens and and all this stuff but i was watching it with my wife and she's watched this episode once one time before years ago and she didn't remember it at all so she was still guessing about halfway into the episode before that just until just before they found that picture that that's what the deal was that this guy was back from the future trying to kill his younger self so after the um after the darkness and drama of a plane crash and a guy time traveling to kill his younger self we have a little bit of brevity in the form of small potatoes, where a town becomes infested with newborns with tails. My <laughs> golden hour of television. <laughs> no, no, this, this is my favorite episode of the entire bunch. <laughs> this is uh, Vince Gilligan plus Darren Morgan equals... <laughs> yeah, I agree. They are so good at comedy. Holly, run with it. Run with it. Um, I don't really uh, like. I said I'm just gonna gush over this episode. Um, I'm, honestly, I'm like Amanda Milligan, but at the amount of times I've watched it, I can probably quote it. To be honest, um, it's just fun. I mean, uh, it comes down to that. I mean, it, it takes away from the seriousness. He's, he's like, you know, you still got the hooky do science, and you know, you got the moment where Scully just gets to roll her eyes yet and yet again. <laughs> but it, it's fun, and I mean. Let's just face fact, every shipper at heart was just dying to see that moment, even though it wasn't right. It's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They're so good at comedy. I love it when they, when every now and then they, they just throw in a comedy episode like that. And Vince Gilligan in particular, he's fantastic. His writing is just incredible. And he does such a good job in this episode and somebody else does a really really good job it's david he is incredible when he yes. takes on eddie's persona yes. it's just yeah he is amazing <laughs> it's like he flips and he is so good at this i almost wish there were there would have been more like this and like like dreamland too this is this is brilliant yes. this is like david at his best i think he's yes. really good yes. at comedy yeah. He is brilliant. Like, his face I, just I, turns to rubber in this episode. Yeah. <laughs> He's impersonating Darren Morgan. It's brilliant. Like, I realize now, like, I was worshipping Vince Gilligan since even before I realized he had, like, written this episode. Like, I hadn't really put two and two together at that age at the time that this was the guy I was worshipping. <laughs> <laughs> I think this one and Bed Blood are the best comedy episodes in this show. They're... Very good. Yeah, I've, I've said before, Bad Blood, you know, I know it's cliche, but it, it's right up there in my top five. And 
I think I would. I think X Cops probably, in you know, yeah, just sort of pushes over it into over this one, in terms of my preference. But yeah, rewatching this one again, it's how can you not love this episode? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let's try and talk something, not just gush over it, but let's try and talk a bit more constructively about this one. I don't know where to start. <laughs> um. The extra vertebrate thing apparently does that does turn up in, in certain genetic groups uh, in Europe, right? You caught me there because I actually don't know. <laughs> because there 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 are different genetic markers for different areas, so I mean yes, uh, like um, a bit of research that I do, um, like I do a bit of research on my ancestry and DNA, and whatnot, and apparently there's a. There might be a slight connection between having that trait and uh, being of Rh negative blood. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know that. I occasionally joke with my kids that, that we cut their tails off when they were younger. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think they've ever believed me, but I will keep I making a, that Well, joke. you should make them watch this episode and maybe they'll believe Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think it would be possible though, to have an entire muscle in, over your entire skin, basically, that like would just change? How would that even work by a lot? Holly, meet the X Files. X Files, <laughs> Holly. <laughs> 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 talking about okay, talking about that though, the whole autopsy bit where he breaks this ta- the tail oh. off. Yeah, uh, it's just ah, oh, classic moment, which. Just the, you know, <laughs> and he's playing Mulder right there as well. He's not even Eddie at that point. Just the, oh. the look on his face and it's great. Uh, it's just everything about this episode is just fun, and you know the 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 um the couples that go in for the fertility treatment. Those are just the sort of couples that Mulder and Scully then later impersonate or um, in Arcadia. You yeah, know. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's the typical suburban couple. I love it when they, in the beginning, when they're, they're, they just meet her at the hospital and they actually think this is like a serious case. And they're yes. actually believing her. Then all of a sudden she starts talking all this Star Wars that references. <laughs> and they're just like, you can see it in Scully's face. She's like, oh, what am I doing here? <laughs> like, seriously, <laughs> this cannot be my job. Yeah, that's definitely the scene where you kind of see that, you know, in the later Vince Gilligan comedy episodes, you know, he's got it down. He's He knows exactly yeah. what he's doing. He knows his style, and it's all coming from the yeah. characters. This episode, I think, is him sort of picking up the torch from Darren Morgan, sort of yeah. taking on a lot of you know the comedy stylings that had worked previously on the show. And that scene right there where they're talking about this whole serious thing about was she abducted by aliens? Is this an alien baby? Yeah. It reminds me of the scene at the end of Jose Chung where he's talking about the lava men because it's a whole big serious speech and then it's just undercut by this completely yeah. random thing out of nowhere. Yeah. I love that uh, she she starts with that talk about, like, he's not from this planet and that catches Mulder's attention because, you know, like, that's why he's there that's this his business that's his stuff and then all of a sudden she just turns and she like goes all crazy and starts his name is luke skywalker he's known as a jedi knight (laughs) he was actually taking her seriously (laughs) and and another thing to mention at the end of this episode and i don't know if you guys know about this or ever paid attention to but the scene on the couch if you pause it at the right time you will see (laughs) that scully has no pants and you just what? I, I, have you ever noticed that she has no? Pants? Apparently, I missed the big <laughs> like. How many again. times do I need to watch this episode before I catch it all? <laughs> right before she gets up, when the real Mulder gets to her door, and the the Eddie Mulder is leaning into her to kiss her, and like and when she jumps up, when when the real Mulder storms into the apartment, and then she jumps up, you can see that she has no pants. And you're just like, okay, Scully, seriously? <laughs> so like, what Why? scene was cut from there, dude? <laughs> you have to, like, okay, you have to feel I was gypped and... again. <laughs> okay, you have to go back and watch it in, like, really, really slow motion. Is she like and that when she opens like... the door, though? No, she's not. You can't be, she's wearing black pants throughout the whole scene. 
And it's just this one tiny spot. It's when she jumps up from the couch. And you can see her bare legs. She has no pants. <laughs> <laughs> and it's for that. It's like a, the split of a second. But she has no pants. And then it goes back. The scene goes back to another one. And I think somebody mentions something about why she had no pants. But I, I, I heard the story years ago. And I, can't, I for the life of me, I cannot remember why she has no pants. But there's an explanation. But I don't remember what it was. But yeah, like as soon as she gets up, you can see that she's already wearing pants. So, either he got her pants off or he didn't. <laughs> don't know. <laughs> so it's just for one shot, and then they're back on again. It's just for one shot when she jumps off the couch. That's that's the only time. Like if you go back and watch, you have to watch it in slow motion. So you're not gonna. <laughs> you're gonna make me do this right now, right? <laughs> you have have to wait until the end of this podcast. But go back and watch it. And watch it in slow motion. You have to watch it in slow motion to see it. But yeah, no pain. <laughs> okay. Um, the Skinner bits. When they're sitting in the uh, in Skinner's office and he uh, catches the typos. Oh, yeah. That's a good scene. That was, I, I, I gotta say, like I said, David Duchovny did, did a great job. That's all I gotta yeah. say. Right? That, is, yeah. that is another really great scene. And it, it, it's, to, it's starting another pattern. Like, whenever they're in trouble in like the comedy episodes they i love that little scene because it's always the two of them talking to skinner and trying to come up with some really lame excuse about what happens and why they're there and what they're trying to explain and that it's not luke skywalker yeah i love those scenes too <laughs> all I have to say, every bottle of wine I've emptied in my life, I've always felt the need to hit the bottom of the bottle. <laughs> it, totally tra- it totally trained me to do that. And I mean, I'm not much of a drinker at all, but when there's a bottle of wine and I get to, to the bottom, pack, 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 why not? <laughs> yeah, that's another really good thing about that episode. It's like, you, you know, like, that's not Mulder. So his reaction, it, you know, it's it's all Eddie. So you can't really take any of that seriously but when you put yourself into scully's perception of of the whole thing it's you know it's like that's really really scully so like she's like opening up to who she thinks is her partner and saying all of the like telling him all these stories and everything and she doesn't back away when he tries to kiss her he he came across that night there is so very generally normal like he wasn't off in one of his tangents yeah. it wasn't a conspiracy for once in her life he was actually sitting there and he wanted to listen to her <laughs> i love and the other one she never saw it before. So i love that um i also love that scully's idea of friday night fun is going home and reading medical journals <laughs> that's great i love the letter jacket i love the gray shirt <laughs> We talked about it on a, on a previous podcast. I forget which episode we were discussing, but she's doing it again where she's sitting on the floor when she has a perfectly good couch right there. Right. I'd I really sit on the couch, though. Yeah, I was, I was about to say that. Like, I do that a lot. Yes. <laughs> it's comfortable. <laughs> I don't know. Because, you know, like, she's writing and she's it's reading a book. So you, you have to be at the same height level as the as the table to actually do any work. But she also has a perfectly fine desk and a dining room table. 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 Yeah. But That's true. There's just something about getting on the floor, crossing your legs, like kind of cuddling up to what you're doing. On a Friday night. Why not? Medical journal. Why not? <laughs> Okay, well, we were just talking about um, Scully's bare legs. Let's go on to Zero Sum and talk about Scully's <laughs> bare legs. <laughs> and I want to I give a shout out to Kava because I was thinking of her throughout that entire sequence. <laughs> it's so out of the blue. You know, it's the, like the first time you watch that and something totally unexpected. And you're like, whoa, Skinner is half naked. <laughs> Yeah. Nice job, Kim Man. You know, and, and the obvious thing to talk about the direction of this episode is that you know it's Kim Manners who did it, so it's kind of like you know the whole bees killing somebody on the toilet is kind of like a callback to War of the Coprophages. 
with the cockroaches yeah. killing somebody on the toilet. But no, let's talk about the scene where he decided, I'm going to put the camera right down by your knees, <laughs> Mitch, and I'm just going to angle it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at the right place. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's pretty much guaranteed, you know, pretty much certain at this point, you know, last time we saw... Um, Skinner in his apartment in Tunguska, we were saying, well, is there a wedding ring still on there or is there not? Based on right. his activities in this episode, I think it's pretty much set in stone that he is divorced at this point. Yeah, yeah, I would have to agree with that. Um, but you know, this is, you know, it's another Skinner-centric episode, so we get a lot of Skinner. Um, we don't get any uh, Scully at all in this episode. We just have yeah. Mulder keeps coming in and bothering Skinner all the time. <laughs> you kind of get to see things from his point of view that, and it's not even a normal work day for him where he's trying to actually put criminals away, and he has Mulder coming in talking right. about aliens or goat suckers or something. <laughs> it, you know, he's actually doing something <laughs> which much more important to him than yeah. his normal everyday work, and you know. You kind of see it through his eyes. You kind of get a little bit frustrated with Mulder because um, mm-hmm. you know why he's doing what he's doing. But um, yeah. it, it's an extraordinary um, brave thing for the Exiles to do. Um, the first act, the first 10 minutes of this episode, there is virtually no dialogue. After the teaser, you have like a good solid seven or eight minutes of Skinner creeping around in the darkness, yeah. cleaning the toilets, burning the body without any sort of dialogue at all. You have to watch the show. You can't just have yeah. it on in the background while you're doing something else. You have exactly. to sit down and pay attention. And that, that shows a lot about how good Mitch is because if he can carry on that much acting without any speaking whatsoever, and that scene is just brilliant. It's so intense. It's so powerful. And he's not saying anything at all. It's just He's just there doing stuff. And it's so intense. The other thing I really like about this episode is um, how you, you see how not, I, I, I don't want to say desperate, but lack of a better word, I say desperate um, cancer man is about trying to fix things with the syndicate. And you see how things are just going really badly for him and the syndicate and it starts with this and like he's trying to do everything he can to fix it and it's his relationship with the syndicate and it's it's i i love his participation in this episode it's it's, you see a lot of what's going on and what's gonna happen in the future like it's kind of like a foreshadowing of what's gonna happen later on and even in sort of the the sort of um, power struggle between CSM and Skinner and that awesome that awesome bit in the parking lot where Skinner goes down and the car just accelerates towards him and he just yeah. puts his hands down on the bonnet right as yeah. you know right as it comes to a stop because he knows that they're not going to hit him I mean yeah oh, and I love that it's that cancer man is not actually driving the car but yeah. that's that's how powerful he is he has he can do that but he's not the one behind the wheel but it's it's all him yeah i i love that and i also love the scene at the end too when the two of them are up against each other it's it's great i was thinking you know we've said a lot or i've said a lot about how the mythology stuff in season four you can see it building towards the movie because we know what the movie is yeah. at this point and between Tunguska Terma you have a lot of stuff about the black oil zero sum you have a lot about the bees and how they are being engineered yeah. to deliver smallpox because we know that the black oil is kind of like a smallpox like um, infection they're saying everything you know these are all the bits of these are all the pieces that we need to understand what's going on and fight the future mm-hmm. so I mean, after this, we we have we have some good mythology episodes, you know, you know, with Gethsemane and Redux, and then yeah. with uh, Patient X in season five. But I mean, we're just treading water at this point, aren't we? We've got everything that we need to dive straight into the movie at this point. Yeah, yeah. I I really um I love the amount of 
mythology in season four. It's actually it's it, there's a lot of mythology there, and it's great to see all that. And yeah, like you, I think that's a brilliance about this show too. Is like the most of the week episodes are fantastic, but if you want to watch just the mythology episodes, which I've done, it it's it's brilliant how the story just flows so nicely. It's it does shows how much the how how great the writing is for this show. It, if you watch the episode, the mythology episodes back to back, leading up to the movie, it's it's like you're watching a giant movie about aliens, and it's really good. Okay, let's move on then to Elegy, um, which is um, John Shiban written episode. Apparently the writers had um, one of their famous index cards up on the wall for quite some time before this that just said Haunted Bowling Alley. And this is the episode that it turned into. It's probably not as strong as some of the as any of the other episodes that we've talked about so far tonight, but it's one of those memorable season four episodes that I would put in the same sort of category as Enrue. I love Enrue. It's such a powerful episode. Do you see what I'm saying? It kind of sits alongside yeah. that. I don't know what it is about the two episodes, but they just seem to balance out each end of season four for me. You know, and it's not a real heavy episode. It's um, kind of a nice smaller story about ghosts and who can, who amongst us is most likely to be able to see ghosts and connect with. Yeah. Um, people who have just passed over into death, or it's those people who are still living who are maybe closest to death. And, you know, there's some nice little moments in this episode, um, but the big thing comes at the very end when Mulder sort of makes that deduction and Scully sort of realises, well, hang on, I've seen a ghost, so am I very close to death? And, Mm -hmm. you know, that scene that comes earlier on in the episode before she sort of figured that out when she sees the ghost in the bathroom exactly. is you know, quite extraordinary in terms of a story and character point because Scully is always the one who gets knocked unconscious or is looking yeah. the other way when the aliens you are running past anything. or something mm-hmm. and now she is on her own right in front of her she sees this ghost appear and then disappear and, uh, you know, it's no wonder that she ran away to the FBI psychologist at that point, because, yeah. it, it, you know, even four years, even having worked on the X-Files for four years, she has seen nothing that sort of blatant right in front of her. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> I love how they incorporate the mythology of her cancer into this episode, which is not mythology at all, but you, they bring little bits and bits of here and there. Yeah, and that's kind of out of the norm for the X Files because yeah. they rarely sort of address those continuing plot points. You know, we we talked yeah. before about um, how the order of episodes around Leonard Betts and Never Again and, and Caddish or whatever goes on, and mm-hmm. you know, I, I think there's less of an argument for the need for Caddish to be seen, seen in a certain order because that's what the X Files has always done. They've had a big sort of character piece. You know, you know, seismic shifts in something has happened to somebody in a big mythology episode, and then the next episode, well, they're just going on doing their own thing. Uh, even yeah. in after Scully gets abducted and returned, you know, Firewalker, they have a brief mention of it or something. Yeah. Like, Are you sure you're okay to go back to work? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. And then it's just back to business as usual. So exactly. yeah. it's interesting. Season four, they touch on the, the whole cancer thing a number of times in Unrue. Uh, which is maybe one of the reasons why I'm sort of saying that this balances out with that. Um, and of course, Leonard Betts, which then sets up Memento Mori. Right. The um, the episodes I found over time, like, um, it, it, they grew on the mythology, yes, but um, when it comes to like just character points and whatnot, it's like they started paying more attention to that stuff in and around season four and out. It's like like you started to get a better picture of the characters and their personal storyline in itself. 
It's like before that, it was more episodic, and like from mid season four out is when it starts to become serial, and it's just within the characters themselves as well. Yeah. Okay, so our final episode tonight is Demons, which um, is the only episode that I think was written by um, Bob Goodwin. Mm-hmm. who is the uh, executive producer up in Canada who is directing a lot more than he was writing. Yeah. And uh, this is the only episode that he wrote, and it's one that it's a standalone mythology. Um, Mulder wakes yeah. up in a motel room covered with somebody else's blood, no idea of where he's been, what he's been up to, but he keeps having these Which... flashbacks to his childhood um, Samantha's there, his parents are arguing, and young cigarette smoking man is there. See, that would be the character mythology I'm referring to. Like, it's more character centric than it is overall plotline. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And I, I honestly, I, I like Demons. Demons is actually an episode that I'll go back and watch. Um, yeah, I, I often rewatch that episode too. Yeah, I, I don't know, maybe it's just Mulder in the shower, maybe that keeps you coming back <laughs> here and there along the way. But, um, I mean, you have to understand, Mulder himself is, like, trying to retrieve these memories, and I guess that sometimes you'll go to, like, certain lengths to do it. It's kind of extreme, but uh, the fact, you know, when you're left with no memory is probably not fun either, right? Yeah. yeah it's a nice co- uh, counterpoint episode to, uh, to um, Paper Hearts, which obviously yeah, yeah. deals with... yes. Samantha and that sort of loss again and this may be that is maybe what triggered him to want to go on and do what he does in this episode to try and get to the bottom of some memories and recover some forgotten memories and of course um, this is the episode where he goes and he confronts his mother um, about the whole relationship that she had with CSM which was set up way back when at the end of season 3 yeah, and that was like the most awkward moment for Scully ever. <laughs> she's just kind of standing there, and she's like, "Yeah, where do I put myself? Should I leave? Should I cross the carpet?" <laughs> you can kind of see behind her eyes. She's kind of thinking, "Is this what you felt like when uh, back in Wet right. Riot?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is the letter jacket moment again. I'm sorry. Like I said, mm-hmm. season four was just, I don't know, just staring at David the company probably just got me true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think David is, is really, really good in season four. You know, by it's, this time, he is. they, they are love. both so good. Like, yeah, Andrew, um, honestly, like, uh, I'm not much to go on about the character traits and whatnot, but yes, I do have a bit of fetish over Mulder's hair. Like, apparently that's really important. And I gotta say, season four for me, especially towards the end of season four, that is the best style, in my opinion, he's ever had on the show. And Demons shows it off quite well. It's that kind of like sloppy poppy dog look from the front, and I just absolutely love it. (laughs) It's my only obsession with the show, though. Like, I'll say it. Like, I care less what they're wearing and whatnot. As long as his hair is fine, I'm okay. (laughs) Yeah, I remember Demons as being you know, a very impactful episode and one that, like you said, you know, it really delves into the character and you get a a good sense of the mythology and things that may have happened through that episode, you know, and it's through the character. It's not just about the facts of what happened. And we get, you know, it kind of picks, picks up a lot of the pieces that we've kind of had hints of before that, um, that relationship between CSM and Mrs. Mulder and yeah. having to make a choice about... The one, thing, the one thing that seemed to be a little bit too easy about it, though, was um, the fact that Mulder was just kind of resigned to the fact. Like, he wasn't trying to find out... He wasn't trying to push the investigation forward, you know what I mean? I don't know if it's because he he really didn't know what was going on. He had no clue. He... He probably he was in knew. The, he could he have done orange it. Jumper, he was in the orange jumper suit in this one, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, that's what I'm saying. I mean, at that point there, it's like, it's like usually he's more adamant, and in this episode he's not. It's like he's more perceiving. It's like kind of more taking it in. But I think that's because he he doesn't know what happened. He doesn't remember any of it. So 
he could have he for all I knew he could have been responsible for it. So what if it turned out that he was? And then what? I think he was he was afraid that he was going to turn out to be responsible for it. Yeah, that's probably. I'm trying to put my finger on uh, some specific examples, but I can't. But there seems to be a, a few times where you have this um, a bad character trait of Mulder that he kind of does just seem resigned to give up almost on, on some yeah. occasions. And this is one of those when he is arrested. He just kind of accepts his fate and yeah. all the fight just seems to drain out of him. And... I'm trying to think of other examples of, of where that maybe happens, and it ha- it's yes, and I, you know what? I think I got it. It happens generally if it's in regards to Scully, especially in regards to her illness, and it's a sister. When he yeah. sees them going through stuff, or when he's trying to solve a problem involving those two, when he fails, that's where you see that defeatist attitude. You see it in Redux. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, we'll get onto that. In a, lot, in a lot more depth. I mean, that's when maybe maybe that's maybe that's why it's so magnified in this episode is because of what happens next. And it could yeah. be just a, it could be yeah, it could be like a character setting thing to make it more like make it more feeling like for what's coming up. I think maybe in the truth that he you kind of see that side of him a little bit as well. Um, I mean, obviously there's different aspects there, and he wants his day in court. He wants to get healed, but. You kind of get a sense of that resignation it, it, about him as well. It's with the Mulder emotion, but I but obviously that's because he has to totally hide his emotions while he's in there. Yeah, that's something he does a lot when he gets arrested. All right, so uh, let's put a pin in, in demons. What's what should we take away from this episode? What's the big thing? What's the big point of demons? I think the conversation he has with his mother about her relationship with him. I think that that's a big turning point for Mulder. And the fact that Scully is behind him for every step of the way in all of this. So that I think that's another thing that carries on for him a lot. Like she jumped at it as soon as he called. She was the first person he called. So. Yeah, and apparently she got up to uh, Rhode Island in record time as well. Yeah. I think it takes her like a <laughs> little, o- little over an hour to get that. up there from Washington. Right? <laughs> that is pretty damn fast. It's the express lane. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she was carpooling. Well, there's not much traffic that time of night. So. Maybe not. <laughs> That sort of ties up our episode discussion. Let's move on to our quiz for tonight. So, Uh-oh. same thing that we normally do. Five questions. Whoever knows the answer, just jump right in. The first two questions are going to be from Tempest Fugit. I think they're actually both from Tempest Fugit rather than from one from Max. Question one. What is the name of the lake where the UFO crashed? Oh, man, it's a really complicated name. I think it starts with a G. It does? <laughs> oh. And it's in upstate New York. It is an actual lake. Lake George? No. No, it's, it's, a, it's a strange name. It's a long name, too, I think. Oh. I don't think I'm gonna remember this. I I just know that it starts with a G. Like, uh, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna remember this. <laughs> <laughs> it is Great Sakandaka Lake. Ah, Sakandaka Lake. Great. Okay. So for around that same point in the episode, um, Mulder is about to dive down into the lake and the guy asks him what his prior scuba diving experience is what what is Mulder's response to that he picked up a quarter a or quarter some out. kind of tape yeah. at the bottom of a pool <laughs> yeah something like that like he held his breath for like some however long time yeah. trying to pick up a quarter at the bottom a quarter or something at the bottom of a 
Yeah. I can't I can't believe I know that. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was thinking of the two questions. That's probably the one you both gonna get. <laughs> the guy's like, So what is your previous experience? He's like, Well, I one time picked a quarter off the bottom of the Y pool. Oh yeah, the Y pool. This is <laughs> 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 it's just even more upsetting because you know the like it could have been pretty deep but not cool. Indeed. okay question three in synchrony what is the name of the subatomic particles that make time travel possible tachyons it is oh good thank oh, you happy. star trek <laughs> <laughs> And if you don't get this on Holly, I am going to be very upset. At the end of Small Potatoes, what does his hat say? Superstar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm better at the trivia than I was at the actual episodes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just love the, that final shot as well. After they've after Mulder's spoken with him and they're walking away, you see yeah. another prisoner mopping the floor and he's got one of the stolen hats on. <laughs> okay, what was that? Question four? All right, last one. Question five. Uh, this is the demon's question. What was Amy Cassandra's favorite subject to paint? That building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The white one. <laughs> the, uh, the white one, yeah. It is uh, the white house where she grew up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think we got, what, four of those? Well done. All right, so um, before we sign off, uh, just want to say to all of the listeners out there to please go over to X-Files, talk xfiles.com. All of the show notes from each of the episodes are there, and you can also support the show by clicking on the Amazon affiliate link if you're going to be buying something off of Amazon. If you click there, a little bit of the money that you spend will come back and help support this show because it does cost money to put this show up and make it available for free for people to download every week. Uh, and you can also get in touch with me through there as well, or on Twitter or Facebook. I'm David T. Harwood on both of those. Uh, Holly, Trish, do you want to give out any of your social media stuff for people to contact you? Yeah, um, people can contact us through Facebook or Twitter or Tumblr at x News. Or yeah. just go to our website at xfilesnews.com all right well that is it uh next time around we are going to be doing gethsemane through to redux 2 uh so that free part story there uh thank you holly thank you trish so much for coming along and being a part of this and thank, thank you. you so much it was a pleasure and uh i want to say to both of you and to all of the listeners out there you're all superstars <laughs> And it is the government conspiracies But I've seen none of the above If I did, I think I probably would run a million miles Lose my little mind Synchrony, I don't really remember I remember like they needed to be frozen to go back in time when someone mentions, like, what subatomic particle is responsible for time travel? <laughs> you jumped right on it. <laughs> it's absolutely universal to science fiction. <laughs> that's like, that's like Doctor Who, Star Trek, Babylon 5. I mean, it's endless. So you say the word tachyon, you're there. <laughs>